the church at Corinth was, to say the least, an interesting beast. It was a fast-growing church, planted by Paul, cared for by the prophet Apollos. It was, in many ways, a shining example, a beacon of light to the first Christian world. But in many ways, it was also a sign to the rest of the body of Christ of what not to be. Within the church at Corinth, competition amongst members within the body ran rampant. They were competing with each other for status. And they used many tools or many signs of that status. Were you wealthy? Well then, you had the choice meal at the Lord's Supper. You had the choice bits of the meal, leaving the scraps only for those who were poor. Were you wealthy? And wealth was a big mark of the court. Then you got the best seat in the house. Did you have, and this became a crucial point in Paul's letters to the, the church at Corinth, did you have the gift of tongues? One of the things that the Corinthians valued was mysticism, was the mystical gifts. And they used those mystical gifts to show their superiority over others. So if you had the gift of tongues specifically, that became the real, the epitome of the mystical gifts. If you had the ability to speak the language of angels that nobody else could understand, then it was believed you were most prominent in the community. And it became a competition. Now Paul's response to it was very, very blunt. He would say, if you have the gift of tongues, wonderful. Do you have somebody there who can interpret them? If you don't have somebody who can interpret your tongue, then keep your tongue still. Paul was very, very blunt to the leaders of Corinth. And I was thinking today about the annual meeting and about how the leaders will stand before you today and how the leaders of this congregation will call us into this coming year. But as I read this passage from 1 Corinthians, I was struck by the fact that as much as Paul writes for the leaders, and he says that, he talks about the leaders, starts right off, don't imagine us leaders to be something we aren't. But there are a number of principles in here that apply to all of us. And that can be for us signposts of our walk with Christ. They can be for us evidence of us seeking to live out God's word in our daily lives. So let's take a look at some of these principles. First of all, leaders and those within the body of Christ are called into a certain contradiction. We're called to be servants, lowly, no lower position than that. But we are called to be servants of Christ, and there is no higher call. We are called to be stewards, again, another lowly position. But we are called to also be caregivers of, as Paul says, God's sublime secret. And there is no higher calling. We are called into a contradiction. Lowly servants to a high calling. And I believe that this has been placed upon us for good reason. So that we will not be arrogant or proud or boastful. But that we will instead seek to fulfill our calling out of a joy of being called into such a high calling. We must not see our leaders as too high or too low. We must not also see ourselves as too high or too low. 
As I think back in the history of the church, there are still some churches where this exists. And many of you here would actually remember the time when this was commonplace, where the minister was placed 10 feet above contradiction. You know, standing high up, and if you go into a lot of old, old uh, uh, churches, you actually, as the preacher, you have to ascend a flight of steps to get up into the pulpit, where you stand hovering far above other people. And the minister was reverent. I remember when my mentor introduced himself to my younger sister as John, and my mother as a bird on. She flipped out, because this is Reverend Livingstone, she said. She said. And the way she said it, she made it clear not only was she reprimanding her daughter, but she was also reprimanding the minister. It was a fascinating dynamic. But ministers were placed, no matter how they may have thought about themselves, and I'm sure there were some that thought very lowly, and I'm sure that there were some who thought very highly of themselves. But no matter what they thought of themselves, they were placed in this position. That it was the minister who would teach us the word of God. It was the minister who would give us what we needed. But Paul would say that's too big a responsibility to place on any individual. And if you looked at our preaching scenario today, he would say, well, how much of the good news do you think can be taught in 15 minutes once a week? To say it is up to somebody who is placed up there in our minds and in our hearts denies the gifts that lie within the body itself. Yes, preachers are called to be servants, servants of Christ. So we must not also go the other way and see staff as just Joe boys to jump when I say jump. Because we're all in the same position. None of us should think highly or lowly of another or ourselves. Instead, we must seek to be, as Paul says, a good God, knowing the one we are called to lead others to. Now, let me just step aside on this for a moment. Paul talks about leaders. There are, within our culture, some designated leaders. You have, for example, a worship leader speaking to you now. You have a music leader sitting over there. We have a chair of the board elected to lead sitting at the back there. We have chairs of committees scattered throughout who are called to lead. We have our elected leaders within our civic politics. We have our leaders within our clubs and our fellowship gatherings. We have leaders at our card games. And this is where the issue of leadership comes in. Because leaders are not just those designated to a position. Here, my friends, is the truth. Leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. And each and every one of us sitting here has the power, the ability, and the calling to influence others. <clears throat> it may be on a Billy Graham scale where millions are influenced by a word. It may be one that you influence today. It doesn't matter how many you lead. What matters is do you lead with all diligence? So Paul would say, where did that go? <laughs> I lost it here. Oh no. So leadership is influence. Plain and simple. And all of us are called to influence others. But to do that, we must know the one we are seeking to influence others to. Secondly, God alone is the judge. Love you, love me. God alone is the proper judge. It doesn't matter what people think of you. I find this one a tough one because I'll confess I like to be liked. Yeah, I really do. I don't like to tick people off. I like to keep water's calm and smooth. But the problem can be in the midst of that is I take up the judgments of other people so much in my desire to be liked that I never stand up for what is good and right and true. 
that instead I allow myself to be swayed by the opinions of others at each turn. And it is a big danger, especially as Paul says, it is God alone who judges us. The opinions of others don't matter. Now, the opinions of others can be a reflection point for us. If everybody you come in contact with thinks you're a twit, then maybe you need to start taking a good look at your heart. Or, the same thing applies to what we think about ourselves. We've all known kids in school who were verbally tormented, bullied. And it's not uncommon in those scenarios to see those kids end up taking that judgment onto themselves to the point that it doesn't become other people's judgments. It becomes their own judgment. Their own negative idea of who they are. It's often in our culture played upon that women suffer from this. And I agree, but I don't think it's just women. I think our whole advertising engine in our culture is designed to make us think less of ourselves so that we will spend money to try to boost ourselves. But if we know the Word of God, then we don't have to get caught in that. Other people's judgments of us do not matter. Our own judgments of us do not matter. They may be reflection points, but that is it. God alone is the judge. And so, following that, Paul says, as followers of Christ, as leaders within the body, as influencers of other people, hopefully into Christ, we must keep our judgments in check. I like how Paul says it. In this passage, he says, so don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions. Now, I've been in churches where it's a form of aerobic exercise, jumping to conclusions and running to judgment. But we are called to keep those in check, to remember always that God alone is the judge. If other people's opinions of me don't matter, then neither does my opinion of someone else. See, it is God alone who judges, and we are called to keep our judgments in check. Now, somebody said to me after the first service, but as soon as we've got some information, it is human nature to judge. And yes, that is true. It is how do we judge? Do we judge in charity and grace and mercy and love? Or do we judge in darkness and viciousness? That is the question. Jesus said, do not judge, and you will not be judged. For, he carries on to say, the measure by which you judge will be the measure by which you yourself are judged. So we are called to let God judge and keep our own judgments in check. And the last thing that I want to lift up today is the idea of sticking to God's word fully. In this passage that I read to you from the message, it says, So you will learn restraint and not rush into making judgments without knowing all the facts. Now here's one situation where this isn't the best translation. The, the best translation I've come across says, So that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. And when Paul is talking about what is written, he is referring specifically to the scriptures. He is referring to the word of God. But if we are to stick to God's word, we must know God's word. We cannot just let a preacher placed on a pedestal teach us in a few short minutes once a week God's word. God's word is something that we gotta grab hold of. It. And it, it's sweeter than the sweetest honey, so sink your teeth into it. Drink deeply from that well of God's word. There will be spots that are tough to understand, but those are far and few between, my friends. The Bible was written for common people in a common language. It was not written for scholars. It was written, my friends, for you and me. There may be spots that are tough to understand, but that means we have the blessing of a community. Of a 
community that together can share questions, can share thoughts, can share even doubts. This is a gift that has been given to us. But if we don't reach for it, then what value does the gift have? We are called to stick to God's word, to stay within what is written, so that we might be a community that influences the wider community. Jesus says, don't light your light and put it under a basket. Let your light shine. But we are called to open that light up. Not to let it be faint, just kind of flicker, but to burn bright. We are called to be leaders here and in this community. We are called to influence people in this community that God so loves. We are called to be influencers in a community that is hungry for meaning and purpose in life. We are called to be leaders. So, for those who will accept the position of servant to a highest calling, who will give God the proper place as judge, and who will seek God's word in all its depth and beauty. Trust me when I say you will hear God's word well done.